to all five are necessary mm. like, what, what's the true church and you have to say well it's all of them isn't it mm. and, and the problem is that most of us have a very very narrow view of what church is because we've narrowed the fivefold typology down to shepherd and teacher so guess what we got to we define church by oh funny that shepherd and teaching outcomes but the other three are missing Hey, before we jump into this video, I just want to say thanks for checking us out. We at the Canadian Church Leaders Network exist to see a hopeful future for the church in Canada by serving, connecting, and resourcing pastors. And so if you're a church leader in Canada and you could benefit from more resources or connecting with other leaders across the country, check out our website at ccln.ca, follow us on Instagram at Church Leaders Network, or hit subscribe below. Thanks again, and I hope this video is helpful and encouraging. Well, Alan Hirsch, it's, it really is an honor to be with you. Um, I'm a pastor and I planted a church with a few friends. And in our journey of making sense of planting together, we discovered your book, 5Q. And among other things you've written and said over the years, so much of your body of work has both encouraged, challenged, and shaped my vision of the church, my vision of Jesus. And I'm just really honored to be with you. So thanks for making time to carry on a conversation I've been wanting to have for a while. Jason, oh, wow. That's a, I mean, it's a very warm uh, greeting. Thank you, brother. Um, I'm always amazed that I end up in kind of people's conversations anywhere, but I'm always grateful for it and I take it very seriously. And yeah, it's uh, good to be here with you. Yeah. Mm. I don't know if this is a cheeky question or not. I know when people ask me like a question like this, I don't always know how to respond, but I'll give it a go anyways. What do you, what would you, how would you name your primary vocation? Like, I know you're, you're a pastor, you've planted churches, you're a church planner, you're a writer, but how do you make sense of, because you're a voice in the church, you're a strategist, encourager, sometimes it's even a, you provoke the right conversation. How do you make sense of the role in which God's given you in the fabric of the church? Oh, that's a, that's a, that's an interesting question. I mean, it, the issue of calling, uh, yeah, I feel like I'm called to, broadly to the church. I'm not, um, you know, like I, I'm not particularly denominationally aligned or even kind of aligned, you know, on all the normal theological divides. I feel like I'm, I'm called to kind of somehow dance between those raindrops. And uh, I, I I don't know, I, I kind of a change agent. Uh, I do think part of what I see myself as a custodian of certain mm. ideas that I feel were bequeathed to me and bequeathed to the church, by the way, long before me. Um, in, in helping the church understand um, it's it's and particularly in the West, the church in the West understand its calling and its its uh, its its agency as a mission agent uh, you know, commissioned by God in the world. And so, how how does mission renew the church and movements? And so, it really a custodian of what I call apostolic genius, which is mm -hmm. the kind of the the inner logic uh, and spirit of the church um, as movement. Um, mm. Yeah, I don't know if that's kind of very obscure, but I love that. And I, you know, like I serve wherever I can as a kind of mentor, teacher, coach. You know, host forums where you know we learn together about how's the church engaged more broadly, in, in, in particularly now in in uh, in post COVID conditions. How do we engage meaningfully in the world? Yeah, hmm. I want to like hmm. lean into that word apostolic a little bit. I think that depending on which tradition you grew up even to like use it carries different meanings, but I think that it's an important word and you connected it to the word movement. Can you just speak to like, do some like term definition for us, as you say, like yeah. apostolic instinct or movemental thinking, like give us a little bit of like a topography mm. of the language. And then mm. I'd love just to lean into that a little bit. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting that the, the, the church is alienated from that term, which is quite strange when you think about it, it's used quite extensively throughout scripture. Um, and really, the, the word apostello means one who is sent. Um, and it translates in Latin into missio, uh, or the sent one, or sentness. Uh, so essentially, the, the, the apostolic is essentially the missionary function, the missionary understanding of the... It's a critical aspect of New Testament spirituality, but I would argue... It, you know, even more deeply than that, it, it's rooted in Jesus's apostolicity. It's his sentence. 
Um, mm. And and so it's kind of you know uh, so I think like you know for, traditions have suppressed it and have even banned the word, but but uh, by doing that they kind of we, we leave ourselves somewhat blind to what the Bible's speaking about when it uses those words. Interesting mm. point in, in case case in point, um, uh, the, we we use the word pastor, um, which I would translate shepherd or the Bible you know it's it's the shepherd function in scripture. We, we use the pastor, the word pastor for every form of leadership in the church, right? Um, but it actually as a noun for, for ministry, it's used once in Ephesians 4, actually. Um, the word apostle is used about 82 times. The Bible means by those hmm. things. So the apostle is really essentially the, the sent one, the one who feels most strongly the, the, the mission of the church and is likely to design the church or lead the church along those lines of being a missionary agency in the world. And why I think like movements um, correspond to them is because um, being a church planter on the frontier, kind of take Paul, for instance, um, um, he pushes out to frontiers, you know, he's seeding the gospel, he's planting the gospel onto new ground. He then guards the gospel in, in, in keeping it, you know, in these letters about maintaining the integrity of the, you know, the theology behind the gospel. And um, and then he networks and creates an organization that's mm. translocal, you know, by nature, but it's extending the church. And I think that's what we mean by movement. Mm. So, um, yeah, it's a very important function. And I think we've got to grapple with it uh, and repent of, I think, you know, a lack of attention to the authority of scripture and theologos, God words in scripture. The word mm. prophet, by the way, is another word, 144 times in the New Testament. Most people haven't got a clue what a prophet is. Now, that's a problem. That's mm. a huge problem. Pastor, by the way, is used once. <laughs> we seem to know what a pastor is, but we don't know what the other ones are. That is a problem, friends. It means that we're mm. linguistically blinded. We're theologically blinded to the meaning of what God is saying in those words. We need mm. to recover. We need to repent and open our minds to think again. Yeah. Mm. I think for me, as a pastor, <laughs> now I'm self-aware of using the term, um, I have felt the pressure. I, I know what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, 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 I love to just lean into this idea of like, what happens when, as a, as a minister, as a pastor, you're unsure of, of your relationship to your calling or your identity, whether it's you said shepherd, like, but I think sometimes that doesn't fit. It's like, I'm maybe feel like an apostolic leader or, you know, to use the terms you use prophetic leader. And these are Bible terms, these are Ephesians words. Um, what happens when we don't understand our identity or don't uh, lean into our distinct calling? Like what's at stake there in terms of understanding this as we live into our calling? Yeah, it's a very, very, again, very just, a very good uh, question, but I think it goes to the issue of vocation or calling um, and it's interesting that the Ephesians 4 uses that language, strive for the callings you have received, right? And the idea of calling really goes to your not, not your, your identity, but, but your purpose and the way you function in the world. Um, you're given these callings, and, and in Ephesians 4, these are given to the church, the fivefold gifting uh, um, by Jesus as he ascends into heaven. So it's a very authoritative act. And, and I believe that we receive our callings, our distinct contribution. Uh, to the world. In other words, um, this is how God has intended you to make your make your mark in the world. Um, if you, I can relate to what you're saying, is that I was called, you know, I was a pastor for many years um, in a local church and in a very difficult kind of setting, um, working actually with Mark Sayers on team and all that. So you mentioned Mark before, but um, um, and it was a difficult inner city kind of context. And truthfully, um, I mean. I, I can do pastoral work. I can do the shepherding function, but it, I'm not that good at it. Hmm. And if I was forced into that role, you know, to be that as a, my primary role, I, I, I think I would have left the ministry by now. In fact, I was many hmm. times in, in, like in fetal position because I, I, I was kind of, I, I don't think I was designed for that. I don't have hmm. the skills needed to be a good shepherd. Um, but as soon as I stepped into the more apostolic role and I began to get clarity on what that meant, scripture and meet other people who had the similar clarity it changed everything for me because i i feel called to be that person that you know sent into the world to help the church 
recover its sentness as 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 as, a, as God's mission agency in the world. So that's my calling. You know, so I I would now do anything for it. I mean, you don't have to pay me. Hmm. I do it, and so so you would too, because this is what God has intended for you. So I think much is involved in actually discovering your your particular profile. And I don't believe you just simply one, by the way. And I think, as you know, I think. Um, uh, you know, we we combine combinations of these five to 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 various degrees. All these things exist in you already. Yeah. Hmm. For a younger leader trying to discover their wiring or their sense of calling, practically speaking, what does that look like to figure out where do I fit in all of this? Well, you know, I would say that um, these things are. You know, you discern them because you 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 become to know yourself, and I think you you would know that yourself. But I think most importantly in the church, I think we know ourselves in relationship to other people. Hmm. Uh, in other words, we need I need you to be me, and I need I need the body of Christ to name, help me understand who I am and my contribution. So I need the feedback of the rest of the body, and so I think. Um, I think this is best discerned, APS identity is best discerned in, in a community of faith where people can speak freely about how who we understand ourselves to be, but how we also being received by other people and get feedback. In other words, I might think I'm an apostle, but people say, no, 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 you're an evangelist. You know, you're impacted. But here's the thing is, Jason, is it's important for people, people to know what the words mean. So like, you know, when, when we use the word apostle in our community, this is what we mean by that. Mm-hmm. Grappling with the scriptures, but mean... This is what, how we understand it. So you have common understanding. If you don't get that right, then all the stereotypes will, 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 will take over. And right. there's enough of them around. Hmm. Of all the, all the, all the, the ministry functions, they've got stereotypes. And I think you've got to be... So I would, I would say as a group of people is to get in touch with the, that whole APES or the Ephesians 4 typology of ministry, grapple with it, and then begin to help each other identify where you actually fit. And then I do have an assessment that does help. It takes the guesswork out. And it's also, there's a 360 assessment called the APES test. So yeah, where, where can we find that that resource? Uh, best place, the resource for most things APES that I've got is on the 5qcentral.com website. So 5q as in 5q as in IQ, mm-hmm. 5qcentral.com. And then there are various tests there and assessments that can help both churches as organizations, but also individuals discover that. A unique profile and shape. Okay, we'll make sure we link to all that in the show notes. I, I want to lean into this just a little bit more. If you're up for it, I'm just so grateful for you leaning into this with me. Okay, you discover some of your wirings, you do it in the context of community. Where have you seen inter, uh, how is the right word, um, interdependency and giftings function well in a local church? Because typically there's one senior leader you know, or that's most common, not always in church history. There's lots of examples of way more diversity, but in an average church, there's one senior leader. They might have a senior leadership team. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that senior leader can have a variety of those gifts. I have a theory that if you have to try to be all five, you can't do it with joy for very long. Like eventually you're just going to no. lose the joy and then burn out. Yeah. Um, how, how have you seen people have interdependency of giftings, not codependency, but interdependency of giftings in the context of a local church structure that's healthy and leads to flourishing. Oh, oh I, uh, the funny thing is that I think we're beginning to see this more and more. And so it's so exciting because it really does have impact when you're not misplacing people into situations where they can't, like you're saying, I'm not made for that. So then, you know, I can do that for a little short term, but you know, you, you give me long term, I'm burning out. I'm not going to, I'm not going to stick around here. So I think, uh, I have seen some wonderful examples. Most recently, I, I wrote a book uh, alongside two other friends of mine, Lance Ford and, and Rob Wagner, called The Starfish and the Church. Uh, Starfish and the Spirit, sorry. Um, and in it, we actually talk about this, and it's based a lot in in, in experience in the KC Underground, the Kansas City Underground. It's a good example of it. But, yeah, they take the empists, uh dimension very, very seriously, <clears throat> and it works very beautifully. Hmm. And I mean, the ways is that, is that, you know, you can, for one, is resolving problems, right? But we've jumped to this without giving any definitions for the others. Let me give you a very quick yeah, one. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, please and do. Just show, show, and show perhaps how we can apply this um, yeah. 
in a, in a local setting. Um, so apostolic is the missionary function, the pioneering, uh, church planting, innovation, and and entrepreneur. You know, it's pushing outwards, planting the gospel onto new ground. So it's highly experimental, and it's pioneering. Um, the the prophetic is basically, I think, two dimensions to it. One is to call us Godward to maintain the God relationship, the covenant relationship God has established with his people, and then to remind us of our covenant obligations in the world, to live justly, to live mm -hmm. faithfully to this one. So that um, so one is kind of more what I call a vertical, um, that is connection with God, and then the horizontal is justice, consistent kind of lifestyle, you know, to, to who God is. You shall be holy because the Lord your God is holy, right? So so that's the prophetic. The evangelistic is the, of course, the recruiter to the cause, the singer of this song, the, the, the you know, the, the I guess the inbuilt marketing department of the church, you know, the person who's able to get people to buy into, buy into the movement as it unfolds. The, um, the shepherd is the one who creates community and defends it. I mean, you talk about human flourishing, and I think that's the shepherd's or the pastor's function, and the teacher is the one who brings wisdom and understanding, mm. um, uh, it brings you know, awareness of what we're doing, but also is, a, is, is not just conceptual, not just intellectual, it's, um, it's instructional, it helps us in the way, it's discipleship as well. So those five, you know, are also functions of Ecclesia. Mm. Every church is meant to have a missionary function. You should, you know, no one gets of that. Every church is meant to have a prophetic function. You, you're meant to worship and be consistent and live, you know, hold to an, a way. Um, evangelistic everyone's got to do that right shepherding you're meant to be a community you're not meant to suck at that you know you're meant to be wise and so all the so we don't get to cherry pick these right hmm. god gave these uh, jesus has designed the church for it you know, for world transformation everything it needs is already there and uh, so these are there and then so when you come to problem solving if you if the team understands and everyone's got their space within the team you know each other's identities and practice you can begin to problem solve in a new way. So for instance, Jason, so let's put at the middle of a circle a problem. So let's say, let's okay, well, it, it could, a topic. Let's say church. Put, let's put the word church in the middle and ask the pastor what is church. Idealize it. Pastor, tell us ideal image of church. And the pastor's going to say, well, it's a place people come to wholeness and healing. They're kind of, they're disciples. They knit together. They're learning how to love. They're becoming mature disciples of Jesus, you know, Uh Teacher, tell us, what do you think the church is? Well, the church is a place of study, of taking God's word seriously, of integrating truth into life, taking truth seriously and loving it. Um, you know, yeah, that's great. Uh, okay, evangelist, what's what's the true church? And so the evangelist is going to say a place where good news is experienced and proclaimed. It's a yes. It's a God's affirmation of the world, all that stuff, right? Prophet is going to be a place where God is loved and obeyed, where you know, it's prefigurative community. It's kind of living in the way that God intended, you know, so it's beautiful. You know, the church is a lovely, you know, love, justice, and mercy, all the good things, right? And uh, apostle words, the church is transformation, uh, impact, you know, bringing people into the kingdom as it unfolds, you know, it's a bigger. So all five are necessary. Hmm. But what, what's the true church? And you have to say, well, it's all of them, isn't it? Hmm. And the problem is that most of us have a very, very narrow view of what church is because we've narrowed the fivefold typology down to shepherd and teacher. So guess what? We got to, we define church by, huh, funny that, shepherd and teaching outcomes. But the other three are missing. So we don't know how to do mission, have no clue about it, and the church is not geared around it. We, we really suck at evangelism, let's be honest. We're not growing very well, and we're not known to be particularly good news people. Um, and, and then, you know, and... and uh, and the prophets, you know, well, we don't even believe in those people anymore. You know, they they were went down with the Bible, really. You know, it's just we have to, you know, this is a huge root of many of our problems. Mm -hmm. uh, and as as you hinted at before, Jason, I know I'm dominating here, bro. You're just butting. No, I love it. You don't don't stop, man. Give me the long, um, some people on the podcast go. Let me give you the short answer. I want the long answer. This is <laughs> Take your time I because the I think the long answer. Here's why. Here's what's at stake, though. I had this. Okay, a retired pastor, finished well, finished tired, but finished well, led a big church in Canada, did a great job, led a lot of people, Lord. He would be an evangelist, maybe apostolic, um, but was also had to be the teacher, shepherd, the shepherding drained him. The teacher, you know, he 
he, he, every time he got to preach, he was recruiting people. That's what he's called to do. And the pe- and then the people on the board said, be more a teacher. And he's like, so he, so ran a, a full tenure of ministry, decades in ministry. And then before I planted a church, I took, I asked him for coffee for wisdom and he brought your book 5Q and I'm not trying to pump your tires at all. And it was littered with notes and folded. He goes, I read this after I finished my career. And he goes, I spent my whole career trying, having to be all of these things and I'm exhausted. Mm -hmm. And he just said, if you can figure out who you are, surround yourself with different gifted wirings, you're going to be able to. And so that's what's at stake for me and why I really am glad we're chatting about it because I think there's people who are starting their ministry careers in the middle of it and already feeling that tension to be all of these things to everyone. And it's, it's exhausting. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, bro, one of the things I'm doing at the moment uh, with Peyton Jones, who's just an amazing guy, he's just written a book called Church Plantology. And he's we, we're designing a church planting training um, system based on five, fivefold. Um, mm. So that you, you start off with that way. And also there's implications beyond the church because they are people. So yes, the exciting thing about this, Jason, is that these don't only exist in the church. They're part of the orders of creation. Hmm. They didn't come from nowhere. They didn't. I mean, the language itself, the word apostle is a Greek word, um, the one who was sent. Uh, in other words, the function is outside of the church as well as inside. Prophet was another function outside the church. Prophetes was like a poet and um, a, for, a fortune teller, I guess, in some ways, but a spiritual person. Evangelist was a secular function. So the wonderful thing is that there are aspects of society which if you get apist right in the church, you begin to correlate better with it, dimensions of society that are similar. And you have more, you've got more cultural resonance because you're speaking within five voices, uh, five intelligences, not just, you know, two of the five intelligences of Christ in the church. So, yeah, these are, there's so much involved in in recovering this um, for, for both our mission, our impact, our witness, but also, yeah, for team dynamics, longevity, sustainability and leadership, all that stuff you're referring to. Yes, and as a young guy, I, I, I couldn't give you better. Well, no, there's, there's lots I what, would say. I'm just simply saying APIST is huge hmm. in terms of getting it right. Um, and in fact, the, 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 the Ephesians 4 points us towards this. The Ephesians 4, 1 to 6 talks about the unity in the church, strife, the callings in the spirit, the bond of peace, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And it goes on to say, you know, in the ascension, Jesus gives APIST to the church. To all of us, by the way, it's all another thing. And then in verses 12 to 16, it says why Apis is given, same sentence, so that you might mature, might attain to the fullness of Christ. The fullness of Christ is associated with this, that you might be a mature body, um, um, every part connected to the whole, to the head, that is Christ doing what a church should do, right? If you mess around with Apis, you mess around with our body functionality. You, you introduce deep dysfunctionality into the church. And I think that's what we, what we have here. Mm-hmm. Whenever we see movements that change the world when they start, they're always got apes. Every time, the functions are fully present, and then the APEs are generally cast out um, mm-hmm. because they stir the pot, I guess, in some ways. Uh, and and then it's a formula for decline. And uh, and so you know we end up with a, a, a very narrow understanding of the church because it's reduced. We've reduced ministry from our fivefold to at least to a twofold, you know, so it's a mistake. We need to repent. And the good thing is it's already given to us. You don't have to invent this. This is already given, aorist indicative, edothe in the, in the, in the Ephesians 4, 7 and, tw- and, and 11, given to the church. Hmm. Uh, you can trust that it's already there. Yeah. Hmm. You made a comment earlier, um, that I resonate with. You made lots of comments that resonate with one I wanted to zero in on. Um, that we're just not we're not getting evangelism right. And um, you know, I I think we're so distracted by real issues. Like this year has been hard to say the least for churches to pivot, to keep the flock in care, to engage people. Yeah. But for a long time, the evangelistic fervor to see people who don't know Jesus, don't know the good news, aren't part of a, a covenant community, included, welcomed, brought in. Mm-hmm. And um, I just wonder what your thoughts are about, like, is 
is have is it not just that we haven't been doing it well have we lost a conviction for it yes and I, but i think actually i think partly because we've stereotyped it in some way too um in other words it's we just hammered a single understanding the only tool you got is a hammer and then everything looks like a nail right <laughs> um one of the i think can let me give you what i think is probably an overstatement but i think it's true yeah is i think jason all our problems in the church are associated with reductions hmm. of what was a greater truth that's become smaller and formulaic and then the danger is in that in specializing in or reductionism is that you begin to lose the sense of the whole um and evangelism is you know such a big concept um because it's got to do with the gospel right the good news now we've reduced the good news and this is really a long long kind of game here um stemming really from the reformation for instance um where luther um a very devout man um was struggling with 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 the book of romans and how can the good news be judgment to me so like the gospel you know the righteousness of god is being revealed of he from heaven you know to me you know this is paul says is good news the gospel how can the righteousness of god be good news he's going to kick my butt um and so he has this thing called unfechtung and he's he's like panic attacks and he struggling through the romans he begins to read the scriptures and the changes his frame a little bit and he begins to see that actually righteousness is a gift to be received by faith and it's partly you know, it's it's it, it addresses his issue of his guilt before holy God. Now, here's the thing: that's true. Hmm. I mean, God's gospel addresses my guilt before holy God, but it does much more than that too. Mm -hmm. It addresses my shame, my 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 falling short, my sense of unworthiness. It addresses my pride, and that that's a different register to guilt. And part of the problem in the Western world, we've limited the gospel to a proclamation about guilt. Not not realizing actually the human being experiences much more than guilt. We we are guilty, but we're also shamed. We're made to be losers, or the thing that relates to shame. But also we experience ourselves as powerless, and we fear. You know we have fear, and these are other different registers that people experience, and the gospel addresses them all. But we've limited the gospel down to just the one that addresses our guilt. So let, let me say it this way. I work with Tim Keller so in, in New York City. So I was living there before I came back here. <clears throat> so Tim would say, um, you know, when you think about, you know, the, you know, people in New York City, how many people in New York City are struggling with what Luther struggled with? He's um in New York City today. Well, not many, maybe 10. And it's a big city, okay? Okay. Um, do, you know, they don't deal, they don't think of God in terms of guilt and, and my distance to God. That's not how they think of God. Do they think of God? Yes, the idols tell you that. Idols are replacements for God, right? So that's a very good thing. But but then you would say like, okay, so the problem is, if the only tool you've got is a hammer, the only way you articulate the gospel is to deal with our guilt before holy God, then what the evangelical feels they need to do is then they've got to... Um, make people feel guilty before they can feel they can experience the gospel. So we come in as the bad news people, don't we? Oh, you're bad people. You're the, and so we become the tongue clucking, finger wagging moralist. <laughs> Not good news. And we take the role of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. The Holy Spirit's role is to convict of sin and righteousness, isn't it? Not ours. Our job is to proclaim good news. But to understand that people don't need to be made guilty, deal with their shame. Deal with the idols. What are they looking for in idolatry that they can find in God? The man knocking on the door of a brothel is looking for God at G.K. Chesterton. Yeah. What is being sought there and how does the gospel address it? What mm -hmm. is being sought? The right thing in the wrong places can be found in God. Now, our job, I think, now as evangelists is to reorient people uh, to a, a much bigger gospel, but having a bigger frame of what human beings are about to. I know it's a long answer, but Actually, it's one I really try to give a lot of attention to in my most recent book called Reframation. Reframation. Hmm. Um, but reframing, God is always bigger. The gospel's bigger. Human beings are more mysterious and wonderful than you've, we've made them. And I think we can recover the gospel, bro, by recovering a, a sense of the wonder of the human being, but also hmm. the, the incredible immensity of the good news. 
that mm. touches every dimension of the human soul. Nothing is left untouched, not just our guilt. It deals with our guilt, thank God, but not just our guilt. And I'm, I'm over stressing the point again. But um, thanks for sharing that. No, don't. I'm the Lord of the Long Answer, as I said to you before. No, and they've got a book for everything. So the book yeah. I'm referring to is this this one over here. It's called Reframation. I really appreciate it. It has, you know, sections on it right at the end about wooing our city and treating, mm. courting the city, you know. And this is a thing of, of evangelism is learning to, to date your city with the idea of marrying her and loving her and speaking to her, loving, you know. It's a, it's a lovely metaphor. We play with it a lot and then. We use a missionary approach to evangelism. Paul in Athens is different to Paul in Jerusalem. Jerusalem's got his King James Bible out or equivalent, um, line by line, precept by precept, right? And But in, in Athens, he starts with their poetry, their philosophy, their religion, and he draws a line to the gospel from their religion. Mm. It's, a, it's a different starting point, and we should learn to read the gospel, read the read the context like missionaries now and bring mm. the gospel to bear, but contextualizing the gospel. Anyway, I'm going on. Sorry, brother. No, I love I mean, it because I think it's an important conversation because I, I spent a lot of time working with alpha and I don't know, I don't know how familiar you are with alpha, but yes, when I course. first came on staff with alpha, I remember we we're trying to do an exhibit at a booth somewhere, you know, this is a long time ago. And, uh, I was like, well, we should just say like, Hey, evangelism's hard. We want to help, you know, or something simple. I don't know. And it was like, no, you can't say evangelism. So for 10 years, we tried not to say the word evangelism. Here we are 10 <laughs> years later. We still don't have another way of explaining it. So I'm, I'm going to just keep using the word evangelism. And I get that it has baggage, all these things. But it's like, I just, I really feel like we struggle even as the church to talk about it. Yes. You know, it, and, and, and that's a problem. And you said earlier, like, we got to get the terminology right. And I get that. I get that the word has baggage. Some people think about crusades. I was like, I'm not necessarily talking about crusades. I'm, I just mean like, what happens if we lose that that one part of our identity as the church, which is to open the doors really wide, yeah, to yeah. to to share the good news real loud, you know, and well, the um, church would be dead. People. It's the death of the church. If you do not grow by by evangelism, you die. It's not gonna. It won't play. And sometimes know? I wonder if we're we're seeing church growth. And I'm not saying this in a cynical way. I've just been. This is a reflection this week. You know. There's we're re-engaging de church people, which is a beautiful thing. I'm so thankful for that. Sometimes you're seeing people who move, they transition churches, sometimes they switch churches. But I think if we actually across Canada found out how many people this year who had no affiliation with a local church oh. jo joined the community, it's I think I think the numbers are are startling low. And and so Alan, like you're talking to church leaders across Canada. What would it look like for us to get real with where we're at and then begin the conversation again and say, What must we do? That we can look ahead and say it's not just about church growth; it's something bigger. It's about kingdom growth. How can we begin right, to think yeah, that yeah. way? Yeah, actually, church growth uh, the, it can also be related to um, to the APS typology, just by the way, and um, because um, church growth uh, is really the recovery of evangelism. It came mm -hmm. about by incorporating evangelism back into the functionality of the church, because prior to that, it was all the parachurches that did that stuff, right? And then in the 60s, 70s, 70s, 80s primarily, it was reintegrated. And um, church, you know, well, of course, evangelist brings people in. And so you've got the mega church as a result. You didn't know what to do with them once they were in there. You know, just keep keep going, right? But that's the problem is that it was a one-dimensional response. Hmm. Uh, and what it lacked is the apostolic function, which was church planting hmm. uh, primarily, uh, you know, a major tool of, of the apostolic. So, you know, so with all those people that we brought in, we just hoarded them up, right? But, 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 but you know, where's the sentence gone? Then it's just mm -hmm. come to us. And, and so I simply say that that in the long run had short-term effect, but had long-term damage because it, it made us very reliant on a kind of a, a single kind of tool. And it, it created some success, but it also created dysfunctions in itself because it can't do the whole thing because it lacks the fivefold typology. Hmm. What I'm saying is that it's just it's one dimensional. But the yes, yeah, so the, the but but this idea of where do we start? Uh, again, I, I think this is a, a good opportunity we have now. COVID is just an example of it. Or it's just a 
just to go back a little bit and say, the word apocalypse, as you know, in the scriptures means to reveal, um, to unveil, to expose. And what it means, and when you look at, read the apocalyptic literature, you discover that actually heaven and earth were always intersecting. We were just mm -hmm. not aware of it. So we become aware of what was already happening. Uh, we just see this all the way through the book of Revelations. It just opens up and oh, all of a sudden, oh, I see. Heaven and earth are radically intersecting. It's always been there. Angels and demons, but you don't ever see them, right? So this. Um, but what I think we, we have, COVID has been an apocalyptic moment. And I would I'd argue this, this is not Canada's problem, but the US's problem particularly, but it might have implications for Canada. The the apocalyptic moment for the U.S. Church, evangelicalism, which has exposed, oh my goodness, um, yeah, all kinds of dysfunctions. And uh, I, I think there can be no avoiding that. Um, but 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 I think that what, what we, we've been we've been shown things that were already there. Now we need to become, we need to have repentance, metanoia, meta mind, have our paradigm shifted. And I think this is a wonderful moment to have paradigm shifts hmm. related to evangelism and everything, right? Um, and I think um, to think again about these things, because the church now is much more a wet cement moment. It's a time to really make some moves. I would not sit on my hands at this moment now because one, I think God is testing us and we're being refined. And, and I think there's no question about that, in my opinion. We have to trust his sovereignty in all things, um, including, you know, the impact of the virus on the church. And we need to repent. And repentance is always opening our mind up to more of God, not less of God. Mm -hmm. God is always bigger. We've made him too small. And I think that's one of the things we've got to do. Again, going to the heart of our spirituality, the heart of our, our, our sense of who we are and what our role is in the world. And who God is, bigger, not smaller. God is ever greater. Well, one, one of the things I wanted to chat with you about is, because I, I love the way you think and process and see the movements happening historically, but also within the context of the church, is, you know, so here we are, at least in Canada, when we're recording, I don't know when they're going to share this episode, but, you know, we're things are opening up. Some provinces are, are not as open as others, but we're opening up. The vaccine rate is strong. People are taking the vaccine. And as a result, it seems like the, everything's opening up. Um, and, you know, I have this like kind of low grade. I don't know how to describe it, like conversation with God beneath the surface where I'm like, God, I now here we are and exiting a season that was like kind of a, a forced like sell of a kind, you know, like a, a, a restricted season. What is it you want to do in me? What is right. it you want to do in the church? And are we going to go back? And there's no back to old normal. I don't think that, but out, out into this next season and will we have missed and Mark Sayers on the podcast over a year ago. And he said, there might be a gift wrapped in strange packaging. And I'm wondering, mm. could we have missed some of the gift? I wonder what you think some of mm. the things to grab hold of coming out of this season might be for the church, things we should embrace and say we should mm. not be quick to let go or to mm. miss the gift wrapped in strange packaging. Yeah, yes, no, it's good, well well phrased. Um, yeah, look, I, yes, I agree with you. I don't think old normal uh, is where we're going. And, and to be honest, let's be honest together, Jane. Jess, it, it wasn't that great anyway. <laughs> we were struggling at it, right? We yes. were struggling to bring people in on our, you know, on our turf. It wasn't flourishing and so what, that's one of the things i think we need to say well old normal might not have been what was best and it might be actually been quite a sinful way of hold, you know holding god at bay so it's, let's see this is an opportunity to let god impact us again and um uh, i think you know i think one of the things that we we we, we can learn is is uh, is this idea of being a distributed church and uh, not simply um being one that meets on weekends, right? So like we, we tend to see the church and, and to be honest, the predominant image of the church, of course, was the weekend gathering and Sunday, whatever. Um, and our budget says that most of our budget goes towards that end. Budget is a theological document, right? Um, 
and that it's all right. You need to worship, right? But we've over over invested in it. So one of the metaphors I use is uh, this one of if you want to learn to play chess, well, you know, take out your queen first, um, and then what's going to happen is, and your your opponent will keep the queen. They're going to cream you for a long time, <laughs> but if you stick with it, you're going to learn what the other chess pieces can do on the board, mm. and then you're going to you know then you can put your queen back in. But now you've learned to play chess. We have over relied, and for us, I think for largely in the church in the West, is the queen is the Sunday or the sermon or whatever you, whatever you, you know, whatever group you're from. But really, is Sunday related or kind of attractional related. And I think we became over reliant on it, and I think it's been removed. And and I think we've had to learn what the other chess pieces can do. But those who have not learned that lesson, I think, will still have to go through that lesson again. Hmm. Um, and one of the things is I remember hearing a Ghanaian pastor, he's an African immigrant pastor in, in the UK, in England, this very big African churches there. And he was the leader of one of these. He said, everyone, my friends and other mega churches are complaining that the, the church is closing, the church is closing, the church is closing. He's saying, no, 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 no. The church isn't closing. The church is opening up in a thousand other places. And there he saw it. He saw that they actually... The church that we see emerging from this, the church of, of people in their homes, you know, meeting together maybe for prayer in smaller groups, actually looks more like the early church than the church that we've become accustomed to. Um, and that may be the one of the big lessons of, of COVID moment is to learn to see ourselves as, as a network and reorganize, you know, what if we had a church on every corner? Well, if people are willing to use their homes, you can beam your service in let them have a little breakfast together and come together and worship as a community locally, then you're seeing the church break out right across Canada, hmm. not just in silos on Sunday. And I think we, if we miss that moment, for, you know, I think we miss something that God is definitely trying to teach us now. Hmm. What he did in the Church of Jerusalem is he had to kind of bring persecution on them to scatter the, the people so that the flames of the gospel could spread throughout, you know, the Middle East and Asia and into Europe. And it was that impetus of persecution, in our case, the virus, that forced them out. And I think we need to learn that lesson. Hmm. This is the church's primary mode. It's a missionary mode, and it's incarnational. It gets into every neighborhood. And we need to empower all God's people, as many as possible, to be those people in their neighborhoods, to be churches in their street. You know, hmm. Man, what a, what a church would that be? Mm -hmm. So I think that's a big one. Not the only one, but it's a big one we have to learn. I really appreciate that. I want to ask you about formation. And as a pastor, we think a lot about how our people are being formed, becoming like Christ. And I don't know if this is true or not, but it feels like the power of the counterformative movements of our world, like just the allure, the amount of information, the amount of, I just feel like they're being the people I'm leading, myself included, are being formed so aggressively by the culture around us, so aggressively. Oh, yes. that and very what, effectively. If, if very effectively. I mean, like, and and to the and so the, my counter, like when I hear you say that, my first, my, the, the evangelist inside of me, I, I jump up. I see if people scattered and empowered and reaching their neighbors and that I, I believe it, like my whole heart jumps on it. But then this other part of me goes, but how will I help them? And, and I, I, it could be fear inside of me, but I think part of it is also a, a pastoral instinct to long to see people shaped in the image of Christ. And I wonder what you think, like, in a world where uh, that counterformation from the world around us is so strong, how might right. we, as the people of God, be formed into the image of Christ in this time? And I know it's a right. huge question, but I, I wonder what you might think, because it's like, okay, we got scripture, we go in, but how do we draw people deeper into right. the form and power of the word and the spirit and community and those things? Yes. Oh, uh, again, brilliant and, and um, empathetic question. Um, I, I, the short answer is, bro, is it's again another terrible deficiency in, in our understanding of Ecclesia is, is, is the issue of discipleship and non-discipleship, actually. Mm. And um, uh, I think the real formation process takes place in that lifelong journey uh, which is not um, optional extra in the New Testament understanding of faith. 
but in what it means to walk, you know, daily as a kind of someone who's imitating Christ um, and, and learning the art of that and that everything in my, in my church should help bolster that capacity in me to be that Christ-like person in life, making disciples. And I think um, um, much of the way we understand church is built, and Dallas Willard was absolutely correct in this, is built on the assumptions of non-discipleship. It's actually built precisely on non-discipleship. It's about attendance. And, of course, that's what they do. They come attend, but they come as an audience. Hmm. So the very thing that you need to get out of them is this consumptive side. They come as an audience. What is an audience? How is an audience different from a community? An audience is, well, think about when you go to a movie, and it's a red-hot movie, and you come out and you talk to your wife and you're coming out and say, what do you think? Right? Oh, it was great. It was this, And then you critique it, right? Well, that's exactly what happens. Oh, that was a great sermon. And it's it's the critique. It's it's how did you enjoy, did you enjoy that? Were you fed or were you not fed? And I think that's the problem is that we've built the system on feeding people. I remember Bill Howell used an image, and I I make it a little more vulgar, but I think it's because I think the image will stick in your mind. Is that you know if you think about like um, um, breastfeeding, like a, a child, a baby child needs to be breastfed. You know, it's it was it's a very important concept, and you can I don't know where you stop it. That's argument or whatever it is, but you should breastfeeding is good, um, and so it's appropriate for young believers to be you know to be dependent on on being fed, and then somewhere along the line, line you know, a child grows up and they, they ought to learn to kind of maybe feed themselves, you know, to make the toast, and maybe a piece of bacon and an egg, you know, they're gonna learn along the way to feed themselves. And then eventually, as they're going to become adults, they're going to learn to feed other people. Hmm. And the problem is that, you know, most churches based on feeding. It's like a feeding. It's like a boob, right? Now, here's the thing. Um, uh, if let's say, you know, you know, you're breastfeeding at, you know, you and I are not going to do it, but let's play play the game. Um Breastfeeding at, at three to five, you know, okay, yes, you can push that out there. But let's say if you're breastfeeding your child at 10, well, yeah, so that's a little odd. Mm-hmm. I think, <laughs> right? I think most people will say, oh, I think that's good, right? It's going to mess with the child, right? And if you're breastfeeding at the child at 20, you both are going to jail, right? <laughs> you're not going to, there's something fundamentally wrong with that. There's definitely, you know, you know you're going to need some treatment. And what we've done is that we keep people on the breast. And I think that what we need to do is to think very carefully about disciple making, what it discipleship, what it is, imitation of Christ being conformed to Christ, being transformed into his likeness from one degree of glory to another, this is from the Lord. This is all Paul talks about discipleship in those terms. And then and then and then I think disciple making is being clarity about how do we go about doing that in the church. And we'd say it's not incidental, it's built into the very nature and fabric of the church itself. So that the church is designed to be a mission-making agency. Uh, sorry, a, a disciple-making agency. And it takes it seriously. Like the movements anyway. The catechism in the early church, they did this. The catechism wasn't just like teaching people heads of doctrine. It was based on the Sermon on the Mount and based on capacity to integrate the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount, mm. no less. <laughs> mm. We need catechism in that sense. Mm. Formation in the way of Christ as community, so that we become in Christ like people who can feed other people, um, disciples who can make disciples who can make disciples, and then you got yourself a movement again. Mm-hmm. But right now we built on consumption, and we we catering to the very thing that's killing us, bro. I feel like intimidated by the switch, you know? I think it's like... I think there's this real sense by which, you know, the conversations... They're happening through the Church Leaders Network where this podcast shared like really sharp, critical conversations, pushing against that consumeristic mentality, but also feeling like it just feels risky at times, you know, to Mm. to shift, to pivot, to there's a sense of like stuck in between two. Like I know what we're doing might not be working, um, but also fear of like the unknown if stepping out, Mm. you know, I think that one of the things I just as you're sharing too, is like a need for courage for leaders today, Mm. like a Mm. courageous leader um, animated by the spirit. Mm. 
Jason, well, the problem is, bro, is that we didn't buy in on that, did we? When we bought in on ministry, we weren't told any of that stuff. We were told, you know, this is what you'll end up doing is running churches, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so I think I feel deeply for my colleagues in ministry because I think, you know, they didn't sign up for this. And now they have to find themselves, they find themselves leading communities that have been deeply disrupted and that, if we think it's going to go back to normal, well, the, the digital cat's out of the bag now, friends. You know, you you want to if we created, if we created, um, consumerist Christians, you know, to consume religious goods and services. The problem is now they can stay at home and they can flip the pancakes too, and they don't have to bust the kids into 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 the church either, and they can not only go into your service, but they've got now what two million. And some of the really best and hottest out there are going to compete with the local church. You, that's that's a there's no putting that cat back in that in, back in the in the, in the in the bag, right? It's out. So that's if we think it's going to back to that kind of normal where we people are just going to come to us to hear our sermons. I think we we're gravely mistaken, and we need to if we, like it or not, we need to find the resources and the skills. This is the thing about disruptive moments, bro, is that they are going to force us to learn new skills, going to innovate. Um, I, I was lined up by three really big Southern Baptist guys once. I was doing a talk on innovation in the church. And um, these guys were like six foot and bulky, you know. I'm not that. <laughs> but five foot seven, whatever. And they had me literally cornered. And they're saying, oh, you're saying, you're saying that we all need to be innovators, but we're not all innovators, are we? And the implication was we're not in, we're not all called to be innovators, surely. And I said, no, 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 no. You don't have to all be innovators unless your life depends on it. If your life depends on it, you'll be amazed at how innovative you really can be. Hmm. And they got my point, is that now's the time to kind of recover some creative energies to, to rethink the church and all the functions of the church and factor discipleship back into that equation. Because right now we're perfectly designed to achieve what we're currently achieving. Non-discipleship is built into the very design of our churches. Design it out. You need to get underneath the hood of that and redesign the thing. And that's a function of leadership. And like it or not, if it's too hot in the kitchen, you need to get out. But we, we need some folks to kind of get there and mm. show us the way forward. I know you've put a lot of work into studying movements of God in church history and history and revivals. What's the, what do you think uh, the spirit's up to? Like, I, I heard someone on a call earlier today says like, well, we need like a new Jesus people movement. I know what he meant. Like, just like where the winds of the spirit blow and, mm -hmm. you know, people are animated in just dynamic ways. And I find myself praying for Canada a lot. Like, God, oh, we just need a revival, especially amongst mm -hmm. the next generation. Like, I'm just thinking mm -hmm. about um, Gen Z and Lord, raise up missionaries in that generation, you know, and fill them with the spirit and to reach their peers and. What do you think about what it would look like for the church to contend for a move of God like that in this time? The the courageous innovation, but also that contending prayer for the power of God yeah, to move. Yeah, yeah the kind of, uh, again, that moment of metanoia. Forgive us, Lord. You know, we could yeah. do this so much better, but look, so, you know, and I think this, I'm, I'm doing a writing on metanoia at the moment because we just, um, we have a very narrow moralistic understanding of what it means in repentance, but it's not, it's actually a bad translation of metanoia. Um, the Old Testament uses the word shuv or teshuva, which means to turn or reorient, what we mean by convert. And then incorporating the, that's incorporated in the New Testament, the, the New Testament concept of metanoia, meta is above, beyond, mind, nous, noia, um, above mind, it means to have a paradigm shift, hmm. have your mind blown. That's what it means. Um, and I think we need that. And I, mm. again, we need to kind of look again at how big God is and how we small we've made him. It's like, have your mind blown. God is mm. eternal one. You know, it's like we're dealing with a, a being of such immensity here that you never can put him in a box. And, you know, that in the, and then you get this, this triune, and, you know, and, and all the dimensions of the triunity of God. Be blown again. Have your mind absolutely 
alone again by God, but also by the other things in our life. You know, just to, again, like I said, all our problems are reductions, making things smaller, and then um, getting very excited about them. Which, by the way, is the definition of heresy. I don't know if you knew that, Jason. Look, not a lot of people. You can check me up here. Just go to your New Testament dictionaries and all that stuff. Heresy in the Bible actually means the heretic. We used to think is a bad person. Like it, like we can, they're going to bend scripture to their purposes. Really, what the heretic in scripture means is someone who's identified something that's in the scriptures. Um, it's a revelation. It's a truth. But what they've done is they've made it the only truth. And they become overexcited about it. And they forget that it actually belongs to kind of a universal matrix of truth that qualifies it, right? So they get overexcited about the little thing. And then they bash everyone with it. They become fanatics radicalized right hmm. and that's the problem is that i think we really basically become heretics we've made god we made church we made people we made jesus small and controllable and we need to be blown have our minds hmm. that realize actually what we're dealing with are huge immense eternal issues here and we can do this better you know it goes back to that issue yes so absolutely let's I think it's it's a recovery of Jesus, the kind of the immediacy of the Holy Spirit and religious experience, and trusting our instincts under the under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to lead us into the places, even if we lack the courage, we follow because we've been led by the Spirit and we'll know the Spirit in new ways. It's an adventure. Uh, put the adventure back into the venture of church, you know, and to get excited again, not just defensive about what we've lost but excited about what we might recover hmm. in the whole thing that's the effect i have uh reading you listening and then chatting with you today is um a sense of like there's a sobering here's where things are at but like my general emotion right now is i'm really excited god could Good. do a new thing and uh i think the times are serious i think lots is that lots is at stake for the church yeah. but i love I want to end there because I love that. Like to imagine to rediscover the adventure of joining God in the renewal of all things. You are been so generous with your time and I'm really grateful. So thanks for spending time with us today. Jason Ballard, good to meet you, brother. And it was really good to be with you and your audience. Thanks. Before you go, we want to let you know about a few things we do here at CCLN that might serve you as you lead yourself and others. We release bi-weekly interviews for you to listen to that feature conversations with incredible church leaders from across Canada and the world on our podcast called the Canadian Church Leaders Podcast. We also send out a newsletter to our network every month that contains helpful resources and content that we've curated for pastoral ministry in the Canadian context. If you're a senior pastor or you're on a trajectory towards senior leadership in the Canadian church, we run a two-year program called the Church Leaders Incubator created for young pastors to strengthen their character and ministry for long-term effective senior leadership. So if you want to tune into our podcast, sign up for our newsletter, or learn more about the incubator, just head to ccln.ca and you'll find everything you need. Lastly, if you or your church wants to partner with CCLN in our mission to lift up and serve pastors across Canada, we'd love you to consider making a one-time or regular financial donation. You can do that or find out more at ccln.ca slash partner. Well, thanks again for checking this out. We love you all and we're cheering you on. Bye for now.